in this short video, I want to talk about how you can use two scriptures in the Lord's Prayer to show that Jesus is not God. Let me show you. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and let's look at verses 9 and 10. And I have it right here, and I'll put it on the screen so you can follow along. Jesus here is teaching us how to pray. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, okay? Our Father. So Jesus is including himself. Saying what here? That he too has a Father. That there's one above him. That he himself is a servant. So along with him, he's saying, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be my name. Oh, no, he didn't say that. He said, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be or holy be the name of the Father. My kingdom come. Nope. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, your kingdom come. That is, God's kingdom come. Come where? Your will be, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's kingdom will come down to the earth. His will, not Jesus' will, his will will be done on earth as it is or already is in heaven. See, God's will has already been accomplished in heaven, but not down here. But when God's kingdom does come down to the earth or envelops it in future days, his will will be done here on earth. What is God's will down here? That his creation, mankind, be restored, that is fully restored to him. Right now, there is a, a vastness. There's a vast area that separates us and our creator. There's a void there. Thanks to Adam, Jesus is going to close that void. His 1,000 year kingdom will close that void between us and our creator and bring it back to where it was back in Adam's day. Think about it. Back in Adam's day, Adam was created directly by God. Adam was a son of God. God created him. Thus, God is, was Adam's father. But there was no void between Adam and God. Adam didn't have a Messiah. He didn't have a Jesus Christ. That he was perfect, Adam was able to communicate with this God one-to-one -one directly. And we see that right there in the book of Genesis. At present, we can't do that. So what we need at present is a mediator between ourselves and our creator. And who's that mediator? Christ Jesus. See, we're imperfect. The imperfection that's in us, the curse of death that's in us, thanks to Adam, created this void. So during his 1,000 year kingdom, which is yet future, Jesus will close that void and restore us to our creator. Then his 1,000 year kingdom ends. But when his 1,000 year kingdom ends, Satan will be released from his abyss of 1,000 years. It is interesting that uh, the abyssing of Satan the devil is the exact same duration of Christ's 1,000 year kingdom over the earth. Why is that? So that the devil will not be able to interfere with Christ's 1,000 year administration or kingdom over the earth. You see, during that 1,000 years, there's going to be a great uh, awakening, a learning. There's going to be the great uh, resurrection in two stages, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. We'll all be taught, we're talking persons who lived thousands of years before Christ even came on the scene, persons who were contemporaries of Christ, persons who never knew Christ or even heard that name. It's sad that Christians want to usurp Christ for themselves. That's not why he was sent. Plus, Jesus never told anyone to be called Christians. But all of mankind will be resurrected from the dead. Jesus promised that. John chapter 5, verse uh, 28 and 29. All in their graves will hear his voice and come out doesn't say some, doesn't say just Christians, it doesn't say uh, those who um, ex uh, accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it doesn't say that. Christ was sent 
uh, to sacrifice his life in behalf of all of mankind to undo the death of the curse of death that was pronounced upon Adam. I mean, look at this right here. Why do you think they were wrapped in this skin, in this flesh? This right here is what drives us and pushes us into the grave. Why? Because this decays. It, it rots. It wasn't until after Adam disobeyed God that we received this. God was true to his promise. In the day that you eat the fruit from that tree, you will surely die. So this is the clothing God put us in. This right here, this flesh. And we all get sick. We get old. This gets wrinkled. It decays. It gets diseased. And it rots. This is what pushes us into the grave in fulfillment of what God told Adam. So Jesus will undo all that in future days. And then when his kingdom of a thousand years over the earth ends, Satan's released from his, um, uh, his prison of a thousand years. And what do you think he's going to see? He's going to see a setting very similar to what was back there in the Garden of Eden. The entire earth, all of this, a paradise, no pollution, fresh air, fresh unpolluted rivers and oceans and other bodies of water. The earth will give us full produce. Can you imagine a grape, one grape that big? I mean, there will be an abundance. We have no idea. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like here in those future days. But when Satan comes out, out of the abyss, he's going to see something very similar to what uh, Adam and then later on his wife, Eve, were in, a paradise. The very same paradise that Jesus promised a criminal that he would be in one day. So it's like seeing every play of what occurred back there in Genesis. So what does Satan do? The exact same thing that he did in the garden. He goes out to deceive. And who did he deceive first? He deceived the woman. He went to the weaker and lesser experienced one. You see, God did not give his command to the woman directly. He gave it to her husband, Adam. The woman wasn't even around at the time that uh, God gave that command to uh, Adam. It was Adam's responsibility as her head to pass on that command to his wife. Adam was head of that household. As we find uh, written there at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the head of the woman is the man. The head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. So he goes out in those future days to deceive the entire world. That's why we see him standing there at Revelation chapter 13 uh, when he comes up out of his abyss of a thousand years. We see him standing on the seashore. The sea is the sea of mankind. But he's standing there. Why is he just standing there? He's not, he's not in the sea. He's on the seashore, we're told there at Revelation chapter 13. He's studying those that he's going to deceive. It's not that he sees just one man and one woman. He sees an entire earth teeming with people, but it's not crowded. The earth itself can accommodate far, far more than um, what we see today, 8 billion people. What makes it appear that the earth is crowded is that we live in cities. Have you ever flown an airplane and you're just flying across the country or flying overseas and you look down, what do you see? You see a vast earth, but you don't see any people. You only see the people when they're in cities or some towns, but the earth itself isn't crowded. Cities are. So the dragon studies people. Then he's going to have this plan in his head how he's going to deceive. So then he brings up out of the sea of mankind, out of the sea, a beast that has seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns upon each horn. And on each head are written 
blasphemous names. Head in this context is to be understood as in the same manner that we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. The head of the woman is the man, the head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. So during the existence of this beast, it's going to have heads that will control it because these heads are on top of it. And we see also that Revelation chapter 17, a woman riding upon a similar beast, except this beast at Revelation chapter 17 doesn't have any crowns on its horns. In fact, what we're seeing there at Revelation chapter 17 is the exact same beast that comes up out of the sea there at Revelation chapter 13. It's just that we see it at a different point in time in future days stripped of its authority. That's why we don't see any crowns on its horns. We're told there at Revelation chapter 13 that the dragon gives this beast that comes up out of the sea with the seven heads, ten horns and ten crowns on each head and blasphemous names on each head, that it's the dragon that gives this beast his authority, his power, and, check this out, his throne. So that tells us right there what this beast in future days that comes up out of the sea is. It's a throne. The beast is a throne. It is Satan's throne that he will establish on earth in those future days. That beastly throne, that beastly kingdom will not be evil on its surface. People are going to love it. They're not going to know its source, but they're going to say, man, this is great. And I'm, they're loving this because it's giving them everything that they desire. People are happy, they're laughing, they're satisfied, they're content. No worries in the world, no threat, nothing. In fact, right there at Revelation chapter 3, I'm sorry, 13, I believe it's around verse 3 or 4, where well, the people will say, who is like the beast? Who can do battle with it? So they're going to believe that this beast that comes out of the sea, this kingdom that they're all going to be citizens of, is going to be invincible. That nothing, nothing even out of heaven, nothing, not even God's kingdom, can do battle with it. But that's why Satan, the dragon, establishes the kingdom to prepare those that he enlists into it as its citizens to prepare the mindset to fight and to resist what he knows must come down out of heaven to the earth, God's kingdom. And the people will fight and resist the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And today we see something else going on that's very similar to that. People fighting and resisting Christ's teachings. They fight it. They don't think that they're fighting Christ's teachings and uh, they're anti-Christ, but they are. And I mentioned those many false teachings already. But uh, in those future days, what occurred back in the Garden of Eden is going to be replayed. And when it's all over, we there will be a, a, a war, a battle between, be a, it's not a literal bombs and all that type of war. This is a spiritual war because we're told there in Revelation that it's God's war. Many will know that as Armageddon. But we're not told that Armageddon is a war. If you go to Revelation chapter 16, we're told that Armageddon is a place. Armageddon is the place where the war will occur. The place is the earth. That's been the controversy from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. Contention over ownership and authority over the earth. See, Satan establishes kingdoms on the earth today, even back in Jesus' day, so he can offer those things to Jesus in exchange for worship. Same thing today. We have all these governments and kingdoms, and people are loyal to them. Their loyalty is the same thing as worship. In those future days, the devil establishes a kingdom of, of the beast, a throne over the earth, and he tells the people in a clever and sly way, not directly, but through his image, that if you worship me, if you do as I tell you, I'll make it worth your while. 
but you must first worship me. You must uh, accept the mark of the beast, of the throne. And this mark is not a visible mark in the right hand or forehead. It is, the mark is a mindset. I can tell if a person is an American if they're in front of a flag, there's a flag over in front of me, and they salute it. I know that person is marked. That's an American right there. He or she saluted that flag, or they recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Or they bow down to, say, like a Nebuchadnezzar type image, like the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I can identify those who are not loyal to, say, uh, the beast in future days, because they will refuse to receive uh, its mark, the mark of, uh, of the beast, in their right hand or forehead. And again, it's not a literal marking. It doesn't work like that. Back in Nebuchadnezzar's day, what marked the people as being loyal worshipers of Nebuchadnezzar and his golden image were those who bowed down to the image. And what showed those who were loyal to God were those who did not. The three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we're going to see the same type scenario played out in future days. This is that kingdom against kingdom and uh, nation against nation. God's kingdom versus the kingdom of the beast. The kingdom of the beast will put up a fight. It's a spiritual battle and we'll lose. It's a spiritual battle. It's a head game, folks. God will say one thing. The devil, who is extremely intelligent, will tell the people something else. People will say, mm, yeah, that makes sense. God will say something. And people will say, yep, yeah, that does too. The devil comes back with something else. It's like a chess game. It's all up here. No guns. Not what you see on these, uh, many of these YouTube videos, those uh, thumbnails where they show people uh, running and buildings are burning and bombs are bursting. No, nothing like that. Nothing like that. But it's very difficult to get those things out of people's heads, right? But that spiritual battle will be lost by the devil and people will see that the devil had been lying to them and deceiving them all along. God will take the devil and those who did not turn around and come to their senses. See, because God does not destroy without first warning because he's a just God. Unlike Christianity, Christianity will say, well, if you don't accept Jesus, we're gonna condemn you to uh, eternal torment in the fiery hell. See, that's cruel. See, God doesn't do that. He's, that's not his thinking. He's going to warn you. Like back in Noah's day, God didn't bring on the flood right away. Noah had a task. Noah had to build an ark that would accommodate him and his family, but also animals and birds and insects. But at the same time, he had to go out and warn uh, the people back then. And there weren't a whole lot of people, but he had to go out and warn them. So Noah was a prophet in a sense, because God used him to warn the people what was going to come. But the people didn't listen. And that's how it's going to be in future days. God's going to warn first and then see who's going to react to the warning. If no one reacts, then he has no choice. For the sake of you know, fulfilling his purpose, for there to be a paradise earth and for people to live on it forever, he has to destroy those who don't want to uh, comply. But now and in future days, the devil will be taken hold of and thrown into the lake of fire. Lake of fire is a symbol of non-existence. So one day the devil will no longer exist. He's out of the way. And we're told there that the false prophet had already been thrown in there. The false prophet is that beast that comes up out of the earth there at Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, that looks like a lamb but speaks as, as a dragon, it's already there. So Satan's destroyed, death and hell destroyed, never to be seen again, people will no longer die. People can, however, in those future days, go into non-existence because the lake of fire will always be there. See, angels are free moral agents. They can become disobedient at any point in time, like the devil did, or the one who became devil in the Garden of Eden, that guardian cherub. We don't see 
the expression devil or Satan mentioned in Genesis. The angel who was placed in charge of Garden of Eden was a guardian cherub, loved by God. He was glorious, he was beautiful. So the devil is not some hideous looking creature if you could see him, you can't. He burns with intelligence. He's a light bearer. He looks like a glorious light of truth, but he's cunning and wicked, deceitful. He knows the truth, but he chose not to remain in it. That's written. So we must be careful because the devil can appear to be lamb-like, Christ-like, and get out here on YouTube or outside of it, these mega churches and other organizations, and uh, tell you that you left town, but you're still in town. And that you believe that you left town, but you're still here in town. He's that good, and it works. But the devil will one day be destroyed, death and hell also thrown into the lake of fire, people will no longer die. And as it is previously mentioned, that people can go into what's called the second death, or the lake of fire, which is a symbol of non-existence. Because angels can become disobedient. We, who will have been made perfect again, can also become disobedient to God, like Adam did. Adam was created perfect, but he chose to be disobedient to God, right? So this saved, once always saved uh, teaching is a satanic teaching. It is a lie. That's what the devil wants you to believe. Because a person that accepts Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior it does not mean that they can uh, lose their faith and stop believing. This happens each and every day. What people need to be prepared for is the truth. Tell people, look, this is what's going on. You can lose your faith and stop believing. So we should be helping people along not to do that. But to tell them, saved, once always saved, now they're settled back, believing that. Well, you know, now you got to do. If I say I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, then I'm saved. I ain't got to worry about nothing. See, that's, that's the danger. People are being lulled asleep. You want to be awakened that you can lose salvation. And today, no one is saved with regards to eternal life. We're saved in that we're guaranteed a resurrection from the dead and we're placed on a path with the prospect of one day uh, being given everlasting life. And we have to earn that by going through and coming out of the Great Tribulation. Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. The many who claim to be teachers of God and Christ, they don't prepare the people. They're not telling them these things. When Jesus says, let me give you an example. When Jesus told his disciples there at Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, to be watchful because you do not know when your Lord is coming, if these so-called teachers and preachers tell people uh, the Lord has already come and he hasn't, then they are going to be no longer watchful, are they? Because they're going to be believing that the Lord has already come, so why be watchful now? See how dangerous that is? If they believe the Lord has come, why be watchful? We should always be watchful. Christ has not returned yet. We should be always on our toes, up on current events around the world, prayerful, constantly to our Father in heaven through the office of his Son, the authority that his uh, Father has given him, to pass our requests through him to him. Because when God answers us, he's going to answer us through the only channel, the only authorized channel that's been given, his Son. But the masses are not being prepared as to what's going to come. They're being lulled asleep. That's why Jesus would say, just back as it was back in the days of Noah, people didn't take no note until the flood was right upon them. They were blindsided in spite of the warnings. My goal and my intent on this channel is to help you stay awake and uh, do all I can to prevent you from being lulled asleep with all these many false teachings and lies that people are being told. And especially that saved, always saved. No way, uh-uh, people. If you buy that, then you're already lulled asleep because you're thinking that you're, you ain't got anything to worry about. I'm saved. Yet Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 23, 
many will say to him in that day, Lord, Lord, he would not heal the sick in your name and, and perform many miracles in your name. And this and that, and Jesus will say to them, I don't know who you are. Get away from me. What a shock that's going to be to be blindsided like that, to have your Lord Master or the one that you thought that you knew tell you that. Please, people. Don't go along with the crowds. Don't go along with the flow. That is a very dangerous thing. Because if you do that, then you're being a part of this world. You're breathing that same air, so to speak, that same spirit. You're taking it in. So that's about what I have for you right now. <laughs> the original purpose of this video was to show how I can use those two scriptures there at uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, to show that Jesus is not God. This is Arjun Harris. Thank you for listening.